statement. I mean, if it if it uh, if it takes me going in a nightclub to 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 win somebody, then I guess that's what I'll do. I'm going to become all things to all men that I might win a few. Well, we got to read the rest of that context, don't we? Look at verse, huh? More, more than what I think. Look at verse number 27 of, of 1 Corinthians 9. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. I become all things to all men that I might win some or save some, is what the Bible says. But I sure do not participate in the sin, do I? I don't believe the Lord Jesus ever participated in a sin. In fact, is, I know he didn't. Uh, based on the word of God, he was perfect. Never sinned. Never thought sin. Never even uh, one bad thought crossed his mind. He was perfect in all of his ways. So we keep under our body to bring it into subjection, lest it by any means when we've preached to others, we witness to others, we testify to others that we don't want to be a castaway. We don't want to become disapproved. A lot of people say that's disqualified, but castaway doesn't mean disqualified. It means disapproved. Amen. And I don't want to be disapproved. And I don't believe you do as well. Now, if, if Paul had kept the world's philosophy, he could not have written Romans chapter number 12 and verse number 1 and 2. The Bible, and you know these verses, the Bible said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, all the mercies that had preceded chapter 12, and that's not the sermon tonight, but I beseech you by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves, your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy, holy unto God, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And I found that God has never asked you or I to do anything unreasonable. And the Bible says, goes on to say in verse number two, and be not conformed to this world of Romans chapter 12, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, if the Bible talks about, again, if, the, if, if Paul had kept the world's philosophy, he would not have been able to write those two verses and mean those two verses. Not conformed in order to win them, but transformed in order to witness to them. Now, we talk about Paul going place to place. You know, we can follow his life in the book of Acts where he went from place to place. But somebody said this, and it made a lot more sense, and it just, he didn't go from place to place. He went from people to people. He went from people to people, witnessing to individuals, witnessing to crowds. And so we need to keep under our body, be all that we can for Christ. So when people hear us, they'll say his message matches his life. That would be a good testimony, wouldn't it? Amen. Now, the exhibition of our salvation, the exhibition of our salvation. Now, there's another verse I want to read to you before I go to 1 Peter chapter number 1. The Bible tells me, in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 6, listen to verse number 9. Listen to verse number 9. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. Things that accompany salvation. All right. Now, if you're not in 1 Peter chapter 1, go to 1 Peter chapter number 1. We learned Sunday morning, if you were here, that we have an inheritance reserved in heaven and we're kept by the power of God. I'm saved forever, according to the scripture, according to 1 Peter chapter number 1. The Bible says in verse 4, I've got an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith and to salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So we have an inheritance. Those of you that have trusted Christ as your Savior and Christ alone. Not what you can do, not what you can say, but what Christ has already done for you 2,000 years ago. When he reconciled the world on the cross of Calvary, he made peace by his blood. God accepted that sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice. The Bible goes on to say that Christ was a propitiation. That's perfect, satisfactory sacrifice. If God is satisfied with the sacrifice of Christ, you need to be satisfied with it. Amen. He seals us according to Ephesians chapter number one and verse number 13 to the day of redemption. Amen. He seals us with that Holy Spirit of promise. Amen. And, he, and the Holy Spirit is in us, the earnest of our inheritance. All right. We know that. Now, I just I needed to say that. Amen. Before I went any further. 
Um, but what happens is we get, if we're not careful, that we get so caught up in our inheritance and our place reserved in heaven. We know according to John chapter number 14 that, that Christ went to prepare a place for us. And if he goes and prepares a place for us, the Bible says emphatically he will come again and receive us to himself. Now, if we're not careful, we get so caught up in our future inheritance and start dreaming about our inheritance, we get so preoccupied with the future that we become worthless to the cause of Christ. So what Peter does, he inserts a transitional word, the Holy Spirit does, in verse number 13, that's wherefore. Wherefore, in verse number 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts and your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Now with that transitional word, wherefore, Peter introduces three virtues which ought to be, ought to be produced in the lives of every child of God because of our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And the first one we read there in verse number 13, 14, 15, and 16 is holiness in life. That's one virtue that should be produced in our lives because I am a child of God. I want to read something else to you too. Hold your place there in 1 Peter and go back to Titus chapter number 2. Titus chapter number two is going to go right along with the message tonight. In Titus chapter number two, the Bible says in verse 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. But a lot of times we read and we'll stop right there. We need to take verse number 12 with it. The Bible says in verse number 12, that same grace teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. The same grace that saves you teaches you to have virtues of Christianity, virtues of life. Peter says the first one, as we're looking at here in our text in 1 Peter chapter 1, is holiness in life. Now, during the times of testing, there may be a temptation, if you're not careful, to modify your beliefs a little bit in order to lighten the trial. Now, I don't know if everyone was here Sunday morning, but that's the re uh, as Peter wrote, he was writing to the Jews that was scattered, and, they, and the theme of the book, is a lively hope and uh, suffering. Despite the people's suffering, they were suffering under the wicked emperors of the Roman Empire. Despite the sufferings, Peter was giving them instruction on how they could go through the trials and tribulation with the future in mind. Amen. Looking to the future, uh, with, looking to the future, excuse me, looking to the future with the present in mind. Amen. Now, uh, this first virtue is holiness in life. Uh, again, during the times of testing, the Bible says in verse number 13, gird up your loin, the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Instead of modifying our beliefs or trying to compromise a little bit because of trials and because of testing to lighten the trial, first thing we need to do is not to yield to temptation but the Bible said, uses that word gird. That means determine now. Make up your mind now that you're going to serve the Lord and despite the trials and temptations that comes in, you're going to sit down and you're going to open your Bible and you're going to begin reading your Bible. You're going to begin praying. You're going to do exactly what God tells you to do. You're going to apply these truths to your life. And when some thought comes in your mind that's unholy and unclean, immediately go back to the scripture you read and begin to pray some more. Amen. And watch God work in your life. Gird up the loins of your mind. Be determined. You know, Nehemiah was determined to build a wall around Jerusalem. You know what he did? He built a wall around Jerusalem. 
He said, I'll not come down. Even though the three ungodly men, Tobias, Sanballat, and Geshem, wanted him to come down, he said, I'll not come down. He said, I am doing a great work. My dear friend, if you're a child of God, if you're saved and you know you're going to heaven, God will use you to do a great work. That is, propagate the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to everyone you come in contact with. So when trials come in and temptations come in, do not yield to those temptations, but gird up the loins of your mind. You see, these were times for self-control. That's being sober. You remember what Ephesians, I think it's in Ephesians 4 that says, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. You know, that's self-control. You know, I've met a lot of people that get angry and they fly off the handle. They just fly off the handle. And, uh, and, and on the other hand, on the other hand, when they're calm and everything, they'll be talking about the Lord Jesus Christ and how good Christ is and, and how good God's been to them, but just don't cross them and get them mad. Because when you cross them and get them mad, I mean, no telling what kind of language comes out of their mouth. That's a terrible testimony, isn't it? The Bible says, don't yield to temptation, but gird up the loins of your mind. Use self-control. He said that's being sober, being sober, self-control. If you can act this way on a Wednesday night at the Faith Baptist Church in Milton, Florida, then you can act this way tomorrow while you're at work. Amen. You can do it. I know you can. Based upon the Word of God, if you're a child. Now, if you're not a child of God, you need to get saved before it's too late. Because if something happens to you, my dear friend, you're sure not going to wake up in heaven, but you'll wake up in the flames of hell, and you sure don't want that, I promise you. You don't want that. So um, don't yield to temptation. These, were ti these are times during these testings and trials for self-control, looking at the perfect hope. The perfect hope is the Lord Jesus Christ. It lacks nothing, lacks nothing. The Bible said looking, uh, of course, in Titus, what is it? Titus 2.13, looking for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, we get that in verse number 13. It says, be sober and what? Hope to the end. I know what's going to happen. Why? Because God has already told me what's going to happen. And so I'm going to keep looking to the future, uh, looking at my, at my uh, full redemption as I go through this present time. And then uh, Peter kept his eyes also here in verse number 13. He kept his eyes as well as his reader's eyes constantly focused on the future. If you'll notice there in verse number 13, again, it says that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When I'm going through trials, I love to know. I'm glad I do know. I'm glad God has put it in his word that there's light at the end of the tunnel. How do I know that? Get in the boat, you're going to the other side, Luke chapter number 8. And when they were in the midst, a storm of wind came down upon the lake, and they were in jeopardy, and the boat was filled with water. And they began to get frantic, nervous. Where's the Lord? He's, he's asleep in the boat. We'll get him up. The Lord stands up, according to the gospel writer Matthew, says, Peace be still, the wind's calm, there was no more waves. Where is your faith? Now, the, didn't the Lord told them, didn't the Lord tell them to get in the boat, they're going to the other side? Well, God has never failed on anything that he's ever promised. Never, never, never has. Did you know that the Bible says that, and they arrived at the end of that story. They got to the other side. God has never made you a promise he will not perform. If he tells you to get in the boat and go through the storms, he's already got it fixed up. And if you'll let him, he'll teach you some lessons in these storms. Amen? So I sure, I sure love uh, that fact that I have a blessed hope, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, but in the meantime, in the meantime, according to verse number 14, be obedient children. Be obedient children. I love, I love the Apostle John. I don't know who's my favorite. I, when I get to preaching on Peter, he's my favorite. When I preach on the Apostle John, he's my favorite. When I preach on the Apostle Paul, he's my favorite. Amen. I just, I, all of them, all of them have some great lessons. But John especially. The Apostle John always, always could not get over the fact how much Jesus loved him. And did you know that being a son of thunder is what the Lord called him, Boanerges? 
And as rowdy as he was and as impetuous as he was, read his writings. As much as Jesus loved him, you know what John learned? He learned how to love people. He, he had, he, 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 in the picture, we always see John's head leaning on the bosom of Christ. We see that. We see, we see John always talking about love. And there's something else that John says. He says, my little children, my little children, I write unto you. And then go on and on and on and on. But here's Peter. Now here is a, Peter, I guess what we'd call a man's man. And he's telling us to be obedient children. Not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your, ignorant, in your ignorance. In other words, don't revert back to the life that you lived before salvation. Why in the world would we want to go back there anyway? Why in the world would you want to go back there? Just in your mind, just for a second, this is all I'm going to allow it, amen? Like I can control it. But just go back a second at the time that you were by yourself and, you, and, 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 and sitting in a chair or laying in the bed or whatever it was and say, dear God, I'm so sick of this life. I am so sick of this life. It's going nowhere. And you remember those days and the Lord has brought you this far. Why in the world would you want to go back to those days? Why, why would you? There, there, there's nothing there. You keep going on for the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't revert to the kind of life you lived before. The Bible tells us in verse 15 and 16 to be holy. And that comes with surrender. Amen. God's order is always salvation, separation, and service. All through the Bible, you'll find that order. Now, the world hates a true Christian because he stands for something that contradicts the unbeliever's life. But uh, according to John chapter number 15, verse number 18, we don't need to worry about it because the Lord Jesus said that uh, the world hated him before he hated you. So you keep that holiness. You keep that life of holiness. You keep that clean life. You keep under your body. And then the whole time you're keeping that life, my dear friend, with the help of the Holy Spirit of God, is you begin propagating the gospel. You say, well, I don't know how to witness. Well, just tell what you know. Just tell what you know. Tell what you know. What happened? If you're saved, you know what happened to you. That's how you start. All right. And then the second thing. Now, we said there was three virtues that should manifest itself in the life of every believer. We said holiness, holiness of God, holiness, holiness of life. And then number two, reverence toward God. Reverence toward God should manifest itself in the life of the believer. The Bible said in verse 17, and if you call on the Father who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work past the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him... Do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. All right, first of all, we need holiness in life. Secondly, we need reverence toward God. Another characteristic in the, in the believer's life should be a reverential fear of God, knowing that we are always in the presence of Almighty God. And there's three reasons that Paul gives us for this reverence. First of all, he says, you're a sojourner in verse number 17. If I'm a sojourner, what does that mean? I'm just a visitor from where? From a foreign land. I'm a pilgrim in search of a city. This is not my home. I'm just here for a while and I'm going home. So I should have a fear of God because I'm a sojourner. A sojourner. I have eternity's values in view and you should as well. Eyes off of worldly things and on eternal things. Secondly, Another reason Peter gives us for having a, a, a reverence toward God is because of what lies ahead. And if you'll notice again in verse number um, 17, and if you call on the Father who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work. What do you think's in view right here? Why should I fear the Lord? 
Because I'm going to stand before Him one day. I, I'm going to, or I hope y'all are awake tonight. I'm going to stand before Him. When am I going to stand? When is a believer going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ? When the rapture takes place, we're going to stand before Christ and we're going to be judged every man for the works done in the flesh. Whether good or bad. 1 Corinthians 3, Romans chapter 14, other places. It's very, very clear that we're going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ to be judged for the works in our flesh. And we'll receive rewards or we'll lose or it'll be burned. I didn't say you'd be burned. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3, if you'd like to read it, that if all of your works are burned, you'll enter in so as by fire. Didn't say you'd go to hell, believer. Didn't say that. No believer's ever going to hell. No child of God's ever going to hell. But you're going to stand before God. And at that day, at that day, you'll appreciate grace, I believe, more than you've ever appreciated grace. When your works, your life is turned inside out at the bema seat of Christ. So that we should have a fear of God because of what lies ahead. And of course, the Lord Jesus is a judge being emphasized here. And not only, not only the bema seat, but I believe he's including present evaluation here as well. Present evaluation. All right, there's another reason that we should fear God. Reverence in our life because of what our life cost. Silver and gold could never purchase what the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ did 2,000 years ago. If you're saved, it's because, it's because you have trusted, believed the work of redemption that was wrought on Calvary's cross 2,000 years ago. The person of the Lord Jesus. God became a man, went to Calvary, and all of your sins was placed on Christ, and God judged Christ for your sins. He was taken down dead, put in a tomb rose, uh, after three days and three nights, rose again for your justification. Thank God for the, for, the, for the Word of God that shares with me that Christ has taken care of all of my sins. So I should fear God because of what my life cost. You remember what Peter said in in uh, Acts chapter number 3, he said to the fellow that was laying at the gate beautiful, the beggar that was at the gate beautiful, he said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, the name of Christ, Jesus, rise up and walk. Well, thank God for the blood. That's all because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, now, first thing we need to be manifest in our lives is what? Holiness. Say holiness, holiness. Second thing is what? Reverence, reverence toward God. The third thing, and the first two you say, well, I, I, I see, I've got the, I've, I see that. But we get to verse number 22, people start having just a little bit of problem. Because the third thing that should be manifest in the child of God's life is a love for the brethren. Look at verse 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. We ought to have holiness of life. It ought to be the manifested in every Christian. We ought to have reverence toward God. And, Paul, and Peter gives us three reasons why we should do that. And then, thirdly, we should have a love for the brethren. If you've been purified by obedience to the truth, then you know that you ought to love the brethren. Hebrews chapter number 13, verse number 1 says, Let brotherly love continue. Continue. We ought, we ought to love the brethren. The, now, I'm not talking about the world's silly sentimentalism, but I'm talking about an attitude of seeking the best for others. 
in, in, in our, when, when my wife and I first started in the ministry, um, the Lord let us run into some people that really manifested this, this particular kind of love. He, he didn't, this family didn't have, they didn't have anything. I mean, it just hardly had anything. They would, uh, the fact is, they told a story, it was the Ledfords, they told the, told the story. Uh, the boy had to ride a motorcycle in, in the winters of Tennessee, and if you've ever been up in the winters of Tennessee, it was a little old, little old 100cc motorcycle. And uh, it's cold up there, but that's all they had. He, that's all he had. He had to ride that, but he was bound and determined he was going to get through school. And he rode that to school to, when he was going to a junior college. But um, he came in one night after school, and he said, Mom, what's for supper? And she said, well, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm boiling some, some stuff. And he went and looked, and there was a little bit of cabbage in there and what little carrots they had or whatever, and that was it. And he said, well, you need something to go in there. Now, here it is, here it is dark, totally dark outside. And he gets his gun, he goes outside, and you hear that gun go off, and he brings, in, brings back a rabbit. And he, and he skins that rabbit, cleans that rabbit, drops that rabbit in the boiling pot. He said, well, the Lord just gave us something. Now, that's how, now, this is the kind of family I'm talking about. Now, I said that to say this. He was, every, in the country where we pastored, everybody helped their neighbor when it was hay to get in the hay. That, you know, this crowd would go over here and get this fellow's hay in, and this crowd would go over here and get this fellow's hay in. And um, there was a family that was a little bit more, um, I guess that's the word, um, less fortunate than the, than the Ledfords. And Brother Gary just got a pair of brand new overalls. And he knew that his neighbor needed some overalls. So he took his old overalls off and they just had a couple of holes in them. And his wife patched them up and, and ironed them up, fixed them up real nice. And, and he, carry, he was gonna carry these overalls over to his neighbor. And uh, he got about halfway and he started crying. He started crying. And he, he was telling me the story. And, and I know he did this. He's telling me the story. And he said, the Lord just smote me right there about halfway. And he went back home and put his old ones back on and took the new ones off and carried the new ones over to his neighbor. You know what that is to me? The Lord let me see that. You say, well, that's, you know, that's, that's caring about others more than caring about yourself. That it's, and that simple little thing right there did more for me as a pastor uh, of the church I was pastoring in Marion County in Tennessee than, than anything anybody had ever done in that church. Just watching him do things like that. And uh, we are to love the brethren. I thought, dear Lord, I need to be like that. I, I'd, I'd like to be like that. I'd like to love the brethren where people could actually say and call my name and, said, and, and they would say, well, he sure loves people. I need that. And I'm not talking about uh, uh, something false or something manufactured, but something in your life that people could see that you really care about other people, that you care about them. You say, well, they hadn't done to you what they've done to me. Well, just look up here a minute. They haven't done to you what they did to Jesus Christ. Amen? No, they didn't. And it's seeking the best for others. And this love comes from God. It's from God alone. If you'll take your Bibles and go over to the book of 1 John, I'm going to close. Uh, 1 John chapter number 4 and verse number 7. The Bible said, Beloved, let us love one another, for, the lo for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. And then if you'll notice in that uh, same chapter, going up to verse number 19, 20, and 21, we love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother to whom, whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, 
that he who loveth God love his brother also. That's pretty strong language. If you'll notice, I don't get behind the pulpit and call anybody a liar. But John says you are if you don't love the brother. You say, I'm a Christian. And you don't love the brethren? Then, and I guarantee you, this is not wrong. <laughs> this, this is not wrong. So, what should be manifest in my life? What should be number one? What should be manifest? Holiness. Holiness in life. Number two. Reverence toward God. Number three. A love for the brethren. I challenge you to go home and read 1 Peter chapter 1. And I just love the way the Holy Spirit puts that thing together. He talks about your inheritance. And then he says, don't get caught up now and do nothing. He said, while you're, go, while you're sojourning, let's manifest some, some Christian attributes. Amen. All right. I'm through. Let's stand to our feet, please.